the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ in the womb of Mary, save the unborn and bless their defenders. Christ the child, shield the innocent and uphold those who guide them. Christ the adolescent, lead our impressionable youth and sanctify their role models. Christ the worker, strengthen all who toil for subsistence and, and inspire fairness and honesty in the workplace. Christ the teacher, help us to learn charity, gratitude, and forgiveness in place of indulgence, ignorance, and arrogance. Christ the healer, imbue the medical and scientific community with a full respect for every human life. Christ crucified, comfort the afflicted, and soften hardened hearts. Christ resurrected, save us all. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, um, today we're going to be talking about the sort of uh, what's happening between Vatican I and Vatican II with regard to what the church is dealing with outside of itself. So, not the internal politics and disputes of the church that it's trying to address in this period of time, but rather what are the political issues the church is confronting in the world around it. Now, I think the last talk I mentioned that uh, Vatican I began during a time in which there was a lot of great power posturing in Europe, right? Vatican, I guess, in 1848, there had been an Italian revolution, modeled on the French Revolution, in the Papal States themselves. And that this actually forced Pius IX to leave, and several of his advisors were killed. He had to flee the city of Rome. And the French decided to go in and put down this revolt against the Pope for political reasons, because they were afraid that the Austrians might intervene. And they didn't want the Austrians to have troops in Italy, so the French decided that they would come to the Pope's aid, they would then be able to get military bases in the Papal States that they could then use in case another conflict broke out. So this is what's happened in 1848. So then, in 1869, Vatican I is called by Pope Pius IX, but about a year after Vatican I is called, about a year into the deliberations, they've released two documents, one on papal infallibility and one on let's see. And yeah, one on papal infallibility and one on uh, what was the other one called? It was on um, yeah, and another on the uh, sort of a modernist modernist trends in philosophy and like condemning those. But while this is happening, in 1870, the Franco-Prussian War happens, the French lose to the Prussians, and the French are forced to withdraw their troops from Italy. The surrounding Italian states, who are then wanting Italian unification, then easily invade the Papal States, and Pope Pius IX um, is confined to the Vatican. To the Vatican. And then, this is sort of what this is sort of uh, what we're dealing with here. So. In, at, when 1870 happens, all the bishops that were at Vatican I have fled, have fled Vatican I. The council has ended abruptly because of this political situation. Oh, yeah. Pi, the, Italian, the uh, Italian unification movement has now conquered Rome and the Papal States, incorporated it into United Italy, and Pius IX has been confined to the Vatican. He is allowed to send couriers out, he's allowed to send messages out, but the person of the Pope is not allowed to leave the Vatican city-state. Right. And it would, wouldn't it be, it would, from, so from 1870 to 1929, there was actually, I guess you'd say, from the 800s until 1870, the popes had been doubling as kings, essentially, of this large swath of territory in the middle of Italy. Again, this had been land donated to them by Charlemagne's father. And there was so much land that you had lots of people living on this land. So the, so the church had this land donated to it that people are also living on, so now they have to like govern the people that are living on the land. And that was the case until 1870, and then from 1870 to 1929, the number one political issue for the church is what is going to happen to the Pope. Technically, he's been confined there by the Italian government, 
the Pope does not have any temporal authority anywhere, does not have any temporal state that he's able to call on the resources from, is the Italian government going to, like, try to put an end to the papacy, and the church is going to have to, like, the cardinals are going to have to do something else outside of Italy, is the, uh, is the, uh, is the Italian government going to allow the Pope to operate and not interfere with him? Are they going to reach some kind of accommodation on papal territory? So that's sort of where we are in 1870. Now, so we're going to be trying to address what's happening in each of these major countries. But the big issue here is going to be in Italy, and that's what I'm going to start off with here. Now, the handouts you have here, there are two handouts here that are kind of uh, important to see what's going on in people's heads in the Vatican between politically speaking, between Vatican I and Vatican II. This first one here is re released in 1937. This is released by, this is an encyclical released by Pope Pius XI, but, well, okay. He, um, but uh, this was actually his Secretary of State was Eugenio Pacelli, who would become Pope Pius XII. And, Eugenio Pacelli is the one that actually wrote this document. It was rubber stamped by Pope Pius XI because Pope Pius XI said, Eugenio Pacelli, go write me a document that says this. Pope Pius, the guy who became Pope Pius XII wrote this document in 1937, and if you read it, it is a condemnation of the Nazis, and it, encouraged, and it encourages all Germans to try to obstruct Nazi, uh, Nazis from gaining additional power. So um, this is one of the most direct attempts by the papacy ever to intervene in the internal politics of a country that had democratic elections. 1939, the Brennan de Zorga, the German title, literally the, that means with burning concern. And that was required to be read by all German priests from their pulpits um, in March of 1937. So that is, so, I might be referring to that a couple of times. The second thing here is another big issue. So that's one of the big issues here is the church, how is it going to interact with these new states, these new secular states that don't have state religions? That's, that's one attempt right there. Another thing here is multi-party democracy is on the rise. This is in, 19, in 1944 when Democracy and Lasting Peace is written by Pope Pius XII. You know, democracy was, I guess, modern democracy was considered um, a very new phenomenon. And one of the big issues inside the Vatican was, to what extent can you trust democratic regimes? Because if you have an authoritarian regime, it's very easy. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know exactly who you're dealing with. If you reach an agreement with those guys, they can go and impose it in law. Whereas in a democracy, there were two camps inside the Vatican at this time. Was democracy just you know, an extension of moral relativism. Because, you know, if people can elect the government by majority rule, then, I mean, isn't the government just going to let people do whatever they want? Isn't that going to lead to anarchy? Right? So should the church be trying to help democracies and operate within democracies? Or is that just going to give greater credence to moral relativism? Should the church be trying to prevent democracies from spreading? And Pope Pius XII here in 1944, says that <coughs> democracy, there's nothing inherently wrong with democracy, modern democracy, but there are some flaws that people who, who live within democracies often don't realize. And then he enumerates what these things are. He says if you live within a democracy and you are trying to be a good Christian in a democracy, there are, five, there are five flaws in democracy that you need to address, that you need to realize your, that your country probably has. And he opens up by saying, you know, these are the problems with democracy. Issue number one, character, the characteristics proper to citizens in a democratic regime. So he says, people operating democracy, the average citizen, will generally think something like this. And these are the pluses and the minuses of that. Now, what's the difference between the people and the masses? All right, um, let's see. Two, the characteristics of men holding power in a democratic state. So what characteristics should people in power in a democracy have? If they don't have these characteristics, your democracy's in trouble. Um, 
State absolutism, for example, is one of those things. And that's, his critique here is actually very similar to Alexei de Tocqueville's, if anyone's read Tocqueville's Democracy in America. Three, the nature and conditions of an effective peace settlement, unity of mankind and society of peoples. So the ways in which democracy can contribute to world peace. Right, he condemns wars of aggression. Let's see how you, how you get, what are the means of peace. Washington's hostilities. Okay, fourth thing, church as guardian of man's true dignity and liberty. So one of the things he says here is that in order for democracies to be sustainable in the long run, the church has to act as the guardian of man's true dignity and liberty. And then five, the crusade for charity, that democracies are only can only can only, democracies can only endure if citizens are imbued with a proper understanding of what charity is. So uh, yeah, so those are those. Also, if anyone's interested in a good book on the history of United States Vatican foreign policy relations, this book is very good. It's called Parallel Empires by Massimo Franco. He is an Italian um, scholar, and this has been translated. But it's, uh, it's a book called Parallel Empires. It's the history of the Vatican and the United States diplomatic relations. Very good book. If I have time at the end. There are a couple of really good anecdotes from that, from the 1800s that are, that are very good. Okay, so who are popes between Vatican I and Vatican II? Well, you've got Pope Pius IX. He he's the longest reigning pope ever. He came into office in 1846, and he dies in 1878. <coughs> longest reigning pope, 32 years. Pope Leo XI, Pope Leo XIII comes in. Pope Leo XIII um, is, he is most known for issuing the encyclical Rerum Navarum. So one of the first, uh, one of the first uh, papal documents addressing Catholic social teaching, and what exactly that entails. Pope Pius X then comes after him, and he spends most of his reign trying to prevent the seeds that are going to lead to World War One. Pope Benedict XIV is elected a couple of months before World War One starts. Most of his reign is trying to you know, make, like, minimize the bad effects of World War I, minimize, trying to minimize casualty counts, trying to uh, get a just peace agreement, things like this. Pope Benedict XV is actually very interesting. If you read his response, he, he gave a big, uh, he, he issued a document right after the Peace of Versailles was signed. And he condemned the Peace of Versailles, saying that it was inevitable that, that he said, well, his exact quote was that, the ink on which the Treaty of Versailles has been signed guarantees that blood will be shed again in war in Europe. It's one of the first, one of the first people on record to say that. Pope Pius XI spends most of his reign trying to prevent World War II from happening. And then Pope Pius XII is elected in late August, early September of 1939. One of the quickest papal elections in history. He, he's literally, it's literally a one or two day conclave. Um, because everyone knew World War II was about to start. They didn't know if they'd be able to get cardinals back into the Vatican to be able to make the decision if World War I broke out. They didn't know if the cardinals would be able to get back to their countries if World War II broke out. So they, it was a very quick decision. Um, Eugenio Pacelli becomes Pope Pius XII. He is the Pope that was during uh, World War II. And then, let's see, and then, Pope, and then he reigns from 1939 until 1958, and then Pope John XXIII comes in in 1958. And then Pope John, III, as you, Pope John XXIII, as you know, is going to call Vatican II. So those are the Popes of this period. So let's look at some things here. So let's start with the situation in Italy. As I mentioned before, Italy is kind of precarious at this time. The big, the big issue is, again, the, the new Italian government in 1870 confines the Pope to the Vatican. Again, they allow him to communicate outside of the Vatican. He can send messengers out. They let him keep the Vatican radio station. They don't block the transmissions. They let them keep the Vatican newspaper, things like this. They don't try to block his communications, but they do say the Pope cannot leave the Vatican. 
So one of the big issues is they're trying to negotiate under what terms the Pope would be allowed to leave the Vatican, under what terms will the Pope have autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the new Italian government that signed a constitution that was very similar to the French Revolutionary Constitution. So this debate sort of goes back and forth. And then in 1929, they signed the Lateran Accords with um, the Italian government. Anyone know who was in charge of Italy in 1929? Mussolini. So um, Mussolini was actually willing to grant the church, I guess they signed the Lateran Accords in 1929. The Lateran Accords actually, Mussolini's deal with the Lateran Accords is actually the most, um, the Italian government, it was, the large, it was the biggest compromise the Italian government had ever given to the church on, the, on the, with regard to this issue. That's why the church accepted the Lateran Accords, because one of the issues was that Mussolini wanted to make it seem like, well, he, well, he, want, he, wanted, the, he wanted the church to not denounce him in public when things start, when he starts to become more authoritarian. So uh, one of the things he does is he gives the Vatican a very generous um, Lateran Accord settlement. And in the Lateran Accords, what it says is that the Pope will be recognized as the king of Vatican City. Vatican City will be treated as an independent country. The Italian government will, the Italian government commits itself to protect the territorial integrity of the Vatican, so it's like they have an alliance. And the, uh, the, uh, they promise not to obstruct the Pope's communications. They promise to allow the Pope to come in and out, and allow people to come to see the Pope come in and out. Um, they also, they also decide they're going to pay the Vat. They're also going to pay the Pope an indemnity in perpetuity for the loss of the papal states. So if that, for, so like it's a perpetuity that you know 1920s dollars. <laughs> so uh, there's a per, there's a there's an in perpetuity subsidy that uh, as a result of this the Italian government pays to the Vatican every year as compensation for loss of the papal states. Um, the Italian government also also officially said that it would recognize Catholicism as the official religion of Italy, but that it would permit other religions to operate in Italy if they so desire. Um, let's see, and that there would be a crucifix in every classroom, even public schools. So they uh, didn't promise to they didn't promise to have religious education classes in public schools, but they did promise there would be a crucifix in every classroom. Uh, Is there still a crucifix in every classroom? They're supposed to be. Because again, the latter was <coughs> ratified by the Vatican City State and the Italian government, and in the treaty it says that this will be enforced in perpetuity. So if they go against it, you know, that's they're going against a treaty that the Italian government in 29 recognized as would have indefinite force. So that's the big issue here in Italy. So after 1929, the Pope is considered the territorial sovereign of Vatican City. The idea is again, the Pope needs to have his own turf to be able to guarantee lack of interference from foreign governments. So that's what happens in 29, and then when they make this agreement, uh, the church then, you know, stops denouncing the Italian government. So, yeah. Some people argue that that is a problem because when the church agreed in the treaty to stop denouncing the Italian government, um, they also agreed essentially to not badmouth Mussolini in public. So some people argue that that actually made it easier for Mussolini to accrue more power. That being said, in 1929, um, Mussolini was not considered as far of an extremist as he would later become to be known as. Um, and this was again considered to be a very moderate settlement that he signed. It wasn't like he was towing a hard line, but it was also not seen as one in which Mussolini gave away the story. This was seen as a fairly moderate uh, compromise. It was the latter records at one time. Okay. So that's what's happening in England. England. This is basically this is the height of Vatican England relations since the Reformation. England at this time, from Vatican I to Vatican II, this is the height of the Oxford movement. It's the revival of high church Anglicanism. You've got Cardinal Henry Newman is at the height of his at the height of his writing. G.K. Chesterton, Hilaire Belloc, they're at the height of their writing and popularity. After those guys sort of pass away, you're going to have C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. You're going to have these great literary figures that are also Christian apologists. Again, 
you know, C.S. Lewis, I mean, Tolkien was a Catholic, C.S. Lewis was not a Catholic, he was a high church Anglican, but he was kind of like an Anglo-Catholic, he believed that the high, the high church of England should teach all the same stuff the Catholic church did, minus papal infallibility. So, um, this is sort of the height of England papal relations. During World War II, the church, I guess the Vatican and England actually worked very well together during World War II. There was a perpetual ambassador from England in the Vatican that was given, you know, full relations. He was there the whole war. Um, let's see. Also, let's see. So this is the height of England Vatican relations. France. Oh, France. <laughs> Um, yeah, so after the Franco-Prussian War, um, monarchism in France is basically dead, so, of course. So, um, there, so the, France has a series of republics, so between the Franco-Prussian World War, World War I, there was, I think it was called the Third Republic in France. That then government then collapses after World War I happens, there's a fourth republic that's established between World War I and World War II. That collapses when World War II happens. And then after <laughs> World War II is over and France is no longer occupied by the Germans, there's another republic that persists until today. But um, one of the key things of all these republics here is one, lots of political instability, lots of party strife, and pretty much all of them took steps to reduce the role of the church in French society. So, um, you know, laws that are passed at this time say that, uh, you know, all schools in France have to be public schools. Um, you know, you can't be, you couldn't be a Catholic school operating in France, um, or you couldn't be a religiously owned school. If you were a religious school, you had to register with the government, and the government had to give you approval to operate. Um, you know, uh, France reserved the rights during the Third and Fourth Republics to, the government would pay the salary of clerics means the government could cut their salary whenever they want. So, uh, and they can also raise their salary whenever they want. So the idea was that you wanted the French government to have more control than the local bishops over what French priests might be teaching from their pulpits. If they're on the government payroll, if the government is giving the subsidy to the French church. So um, relations with France were on the whole pretty bad um, between Vatican I and Vatican II. Um, when you talk about the republic, you can talk about the form of government. Yes. Yeah. Not yes. like a, a state. Yeah. yeah. So that's so France. So relations with France at this time were pretty bad. The church. This is a time when there are still people alive in France that remember when, like, French society revolved around Catholicism, and but the a series of French governments starting in 1870 try to break this down as much as possible. You know, there's. Prior to prior to the 1870s, 1880s, um, you know, the church was in charge of marriage law in France. The French government says, no, no, no. They go from the church in charge of marriage law, period, to the church has no influence on it, whatever. The government is entirely in charge of marriage. Right. They go from the church, the church operates all the schools in France. To the church cannot operate any schools in France unless the state gives permission. Right. So it's uh, those are some things going on in France. You know, divorce is legalized in France at this time. Things like that. Um, Germany. Oh, Germany. Okay, so Germany is you know uh, an interesting case at this time. From Pope Pius the Ninth and Pope Leo the Thirteenth. These guys were mostly dealing with the Prussian takeover of the German states, and there was what was called the, cult, the culture war, in which the, Ger the, the Protestant majority of the new German state passed laws that made it harder for the Catholic minority, particularly in southern Germany, to operate. So for example, um, the German government under Bismarck passed laws passed you know, that would not recognize Catholic marriages. You had to have a Protestant marriage to be, rec to be recognized by law in Germany. Um, let's see, you know, the uh, Catholics had to pay higher rates of taxes than Protestants did. Um, there were certain, you know, if you were a Catholic in Germany, you could not get, you could not get a government job. Um, you could not be an officer in the German army if you were a Catholic. You had to be a Protestant to be an, to be an officer in the German army under Bismarck. Um, 
So there are a whole series of things like this that happen under Bismarck. Now, um, when World War I happens, of course, that's sort of an end to that, to like the, the Bismarck <coughs> singling out of Catholics. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so that's the end sort of the Bismarck singling out of Catholics. But during the Weimar Republic, between World War I and World War II, during the Weimar Republic, there's um, a big issue because um, there were several political parties in the Weimar Republic that were all competing for power. All right? There was, of course, the socialists on one end, there were the Nazis on the other end. But then there, but then there was this, there were a couple of other minor parties, but the biggest of the minor parties was called the Catholic Center Party. And it was a political party that had been started by a German priest named Father Koss. Now it was a it was a political party called the Catholic Center Party, and it was it was um, again founded by a, Catholic, a German Catholic priest named Father Koss. And Father Koss, his his, his political party, um, if it would would often. It, the, the, the Catholic Center Party, its its purpose was to try to prevent the socialists and the Nazis from coming to power. So what they would do is they would run for office and then they would immediately go, they would immediately try to get like all of the other parties in Germany to like coalition together so that neither the socialists, so that, so that the, neither the Communist Party nor the Nazi Party would be able to get enough of a majority to form a government. So this is what's happening in the Weimar Republic. Now one of the issues is that eventually what ends up happening is that in the 1930s, in 1932 or 33, what ends up happening is that A lot of the other minor parties that the Catholic Center Party normally coalitioned with lost seats to the Communists and the Nazis. So you had these three parties now, each basically controlled a third of the German parliament. And whoever had the majority would be able to govern. Now the German the Catholic Center Party, it wanted to prevent the socialists and the Nazis from reaching an accommodation over and against the Catholic Center Party. So they had a choice. They could either try to go into a coalition government with the communists and try to work with the communists, or they could try to work in a coalition government with the Nazis. So what they decided to do was to enter into a coalition government with the Nazis. Each of them had roughly the same um, number of seats in parliament. And the Nazis' price for this was that um, in exchange for a, in exchange for Hitler becoming chancellor, the Nazis would back a lot of the other things that the Catholic Center Party wanted. Right. So in exchange for Hitler becoming the chancellor, the Nazis would accept like other restrictions on the chancellor's power. So they said deal. And then, when Hitler be when Hitler becomes chancellor, after he gets the coalition government, he does two things. First thing. Um, he then he then wants to go. He then goes to the Vatican to Pope Pius XI, and he signs a concordat. Which the idea was that he's like, you know what, the communists in Germany, they're such a they're they're they, you know they're locked out of the government. You know you know in Spain right now in Spain right now, the communists are engaging in a big you know attempt to kill lots of Catholic priests, nuns, burn churches, etc. <coughs> I can't guarantee the safety of Catholics in Germany unless we have a treaty. So, Pope Pius XI negotiates a treaty with the German government in which Hitler is chancellor. And he agrees that, and one, there are two conditions to this. Number one, like in, like in Italy, the church will agree 
This is just, again, this is just three or four years after the Lateran Accords. The church will agree not to denounce the German government in public, by name, specifically. All right, that's one thing. Um, the second, the second uh, part to the Concordat is that the Catholic Church, Catholic or, uh, the Catholic Church will cease to fund political parties. We want the church out of, we want the church not to be funding political parties. So when the church, signed, when the Vatican signs this concordat, what ends up happening is that most of the funding is pulled from the Catholic Center Party. It's more, much more difficult for them to run for election now against the Nazis and the communists. After that happens, you then have the Reichstag burning very shortly after, in which the parliament votes, the chancellor emergency powers, and from that, from the burning of the Reichstag until 1945, the Nazis were operating under an emergency powers clause in the Weimar Republic's constitution. So they were they were ruling under they were ruling under under emergency powers for basically 11 years until the day of the fall. So um, this is so this is one of the issues with Germany and the Weimar Republic. Um, let's see. During World War One, Pope Benedict XV had believed again that the Allies were imposing an unjust peace treaty on Germany, and that he thought it would be more likely that eventually you'd get a German government that would try to use that treaty to start another war. I might say Pope Benedict XV was kind of prescient there. Pope Pius XII then becomes Pope in 1939 on the eve of World War, um, but in 37, two years before he's elected, this is after after the Reichstag burning and after the Concordat with Hitler, Pope Pius XI issues this document, which was smuggled into Germany. It was supposed to be read from pulpits, and it was supposed to be under the radar of the German government, so the church would not seem like it was um, violating the terms of the Concordat. They felt that if it seemed like they were violating the terms of the Concordat, that that would, um, make, that would make things even worse. That the Germans would come down with an even harder hand on Catholics. So this document is issued, it's read from the pulpit everywhere in Germany in March in 1937, every Catholic church. Um, with Brian de Zora. And then Pius XII, who wrote this document, becomes elected during World War II, and uh, he spends most of World War II, um, well, doing lots of stuff. <laughs> if anyone's seen the movie The Scarlet and the Black, um, one of the things you'll see here is that during World War II, the Vatican radio, Vatican radio would regularly report um, what kinds of human rights violations were happening based on their sources. Um, so if there were priests, say, in Germany or in France that saw things, they would report back to, to the Vatican what was going on on the regular reports. Vatican radio would then say these out loud. Pius XII, however, did not himself during World War II say things out loud what the Nazis were doing. Vatican <coughs> Radio did do it. Now many people say, well, what Vatican Radio is doing it, why isn't the Pope doing it? Well, perhaps plausible deniability, right? I mean, if the, uh, if the Nazis go to the Pope and say, excuse me, <laughs> um, Vatican Radio, what's going on here? The Pope can say, really, Vatican Radio is denouncing the Nazis? You know, I very rarely listen to my own radio station. Um, sure, I'd be happy to look into that. There are also, we also know now in retrospect that there were lots of um, people on the Pope's personal staff that were operating clandestinely to um, gather information and pass it on to the Allies. There were also many members of the Pope's personal staff that were operating clandestinely to try to figure out what kinds of figures might be people the Nazis want to arrest and stash them in religious houses and convents. Um, one of the things that was part of the Concordat was that the Concordat with Hitler actually said, actually, the Germans agreed that they would not enter into monasteries and religious houses as a condition of that Concordat. So Pius XII figured, you know, well, he actually gave orders to every monastery in Europe to be able to to be willing to accept refugees and try to pass them off as monks and nuns, so that if the Nazis, first of all, for, so first of all the Nazis would be less likely to enter a convent in the first place. Second, if they do, 
those people are supposed to be acting like monks and nuns so that they won't think there's anything going on. Um, so if anyone's seen like you know the Sound of Music, that really happened, <laughs> where they, the the nuns would open up the monastery and you know hide people and make them, train them to be monks and nuns. There's also a very good um, movie, a French movie, released in the '80s called Au Revoir, oh, Revoir les Enfants, right? Um, Goodbye, children. And this is a story of a of a boarding school in France operated by Franciscan monks. And one of the things they would do is if uh, is uh, they would try to figure out um, what if there were people that needed to flee but didn't think they could take their children with them. What they would do is they would either they would they would take the children and enroll them in the boarding school, and they would uh, they would have the kids at the boarding school. And then if the Nazis came in and said, you know, do you have anyone hiding here? They'll say, well, no, we just have children in the boarding school. Or if there were, or if there were people that were maybe, um, you know, uh, hiding at needing, needing to be hit as well, they would, uh, they would dress them up as Franciscans and put them in charge of teaching classes, so that the, so that the Germans would come in and you know, uh, think that everyone was a Franciscan and that all the kids there were from, uh, you know, were from wealthy French families. Um, so that was actually a real story as well. So. Um, See. The Germans, when Mussolini's government falls in Italy, the Germans take over Italy, and uh, the Germans take over Italy, particularly take over Rome. And this is what the movie The Scarlet and Black is about. Well, it's a Gregory Peck movie. And uh, one of the things that happens there is that the Germans actually demand that the Jews pay them a ransom not to deport them back to the Third Reich, not to, to deport them to German concentration camps. And they agree, and the uh, they said that if the if the Jews of if the Roman Jews paid them this money, they would not deport them. They asked for more money than like the combined wealth of like all of the German all of the uh, Jews in Rome. So it happened. So it was widely suspected that um, that Pope Pius XII authorized the Catholic Church to put up some of the protection money. The only problem was the Germans once they received the protection money, they deported the Jews anyway. So, Castel Gandolfo was open to the public. So they opened Castel Gandolfo to hide people that to hide people from the Germans as well. So Castel Gandolfo, I think, had hit about seven thousand refugees. The Pope's summer palace. Okay. So Germany. Any questions on Germany? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm sitting here trying to absorb a whole lot, a little bit above me. Uh, a whole lot about me, and you have such a great knowledge, but I have a friend that puts down the Catholic Church a lot because of the collaboration with Hitler back then, like you're talking about, but it sounded to me like because of where they were located, they had to do certain things to maybe benefit them, like the monasteries and stuff. What I'm, what I'm getting at is, what would be a good rebuttal for me to talk to this person? Because I think a whole lot of it is lack of knowledge, historically and whatever. They jump on something out of context and make a big issue out of it. Yeah, and I, I just wonder, what, how can I come back as a witness for the church to substantiate what they did, so to speak? You got sure. any comments on that? Yeah, I guess. When this, I mean, let's, let's come up with my students. A couple of things I'll, I'll mention is number one, if the church was such a big, first of all, um, let's see, first of all, 1937, the church renounced the Nazis. Uh, second issue, um, second issue, I would say that if the church, if the Nazis were such big fans of the church, why, when they invaded Italy in 1943, why did they confine the Pope to the Vatican, not allow him to leave, and then also try to arrest many of his personal staff who were engaged in clandestine operations? So let's put it this way. It's not like when the Nazis got to Italy, they said, oh, look, the Vatican is one of our allies. <laughs> um, they we have diplomatic communiques that regularly have them regularly have them, you know, uh, corresponding with the Vatican saying, how dare you put that on Vatican radio? You know, um, 
you know, we suspect, we have these Nazi communiques saying, we suspect the Vatican might be hiding people, but the only way we can do this is to go in and shoot up the Vatican, so I guess we have to live with that kind of stuff. Um, so, I would say, one, there's, first of all, there's no evidence that the church collaborated with the Nazis. Second, there's a lot more evidence to suggest the church was very anti-Nazi. Look at the documents that were going out. Look at what Vatican Radio was saying during World War II. Look at all of the monasteries and convents that were open to the public for them to hide people. Um, you know, um, let's see, what else would I say? You know, I would say if, if, if someone's criticizing the Concordat with Hitler in 1932 in the first place, then, you, I mean, you just have, I, I, would, I would say, number one, Look at what was happening in Spain at the time. The Nazis' political opposition were people that were executing priests, nuns, and Catholics and burning churches by the thousands. So when the Nazis are trying to negotiate the Concordat, they're actually using that as a way to try to get the church to negotiate. The church did not want to negotiate with the Nazis. It felt that it had no choice. It was either negotiate with the Nazis and hope that Hitler's not going to double-cross you, and hope that the Catholic Center Party will be strong enough to provide a check against him. Or, do nothing, now the Nazis are pissed at you, and there's no legal, and there's no uh, legal agreement on paper that would protect Catholic churches from communists. Which again, at the time, were killing priests, nuns, Catholics, burning churches by the thousands. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's like the old, you know, it's so like the old proverb where you have, the old story where you have, uh, you know, there's the scorpion that wants to get the ride on the fox across the river, and the fox is like, well, if I give you, if I give the scorpion a ride across the river, you could sting me and I could die. And the scorpion says, well, no, because if I'm on your back and I sting you, I'm going to drown too. And then the fox says, oh, okay. And then the scorpion stings him anyway. And, you know, the scorpion says, well, it's just my nature. I'm sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> so that's what I would say. I would say there's, there's, no, there's no compelling evidence that the church collaborated with the Nazis. There's more evidence to the contrary that they didn't. The only thing that you could point out that the church collaborated with the Nazis is Pius XII didn't personally denounce the Nazis during the war. He did before the war. He didn't during the war. But Pius XII's People working underneath Pius XII denounced the Nazis. Vatican Radio denounced the Nazis. <laughs> the Nazis didn't treat Pius XII very friendly-like. And if you're, if she was the Concordat, then look at what else is going on in Europe. I mean, it's sort of, you're caught between a rock and a hard place. You can either trust the Nazis and hope that the Catholic Center Party is strong enough. After all, you signed a similar thing with Mussolini, and Mussolini didn't do anything to the church four years, four years prior to this. Yeah. So, so in the United States at this time, what was the, you know, how did the, I mean, I don't know, you don't know, I don't know, I was a mere baby, <laughs> but how did the Catholics in this country react to the fact that, that it, you know, the Pope wasn't saying anything, I mean, they wouldn't have been listening to Vatican Radio, or, mm, yeah. you know, do you have any sense of that and how that? Uh, um, well, I will say that the, the vast majority of American Catholics from, from what we can tell from historical documents, um, you know, reacted a lot like a lot, a lot of other Americans in that that's Europe's war. We don't want to get involved. And then once Japan bombs you, yeah, you know, take those guys out. So uh, and then and then lots of so I guess one of the big things is that during the war there's almost no criticism of Pius XII's handling of of the war. Almost all of the criticism of Pius XII. The first, the first book we have that criticizes Pius XII's action during World War II was written in the 1960s. Who right. wrote that? Um, Ralph Hakut. Did he have something against him? Called the Deputy. Did he have something against him, or just? Well, his his the thesis of his book was that was that the Germans could not have gotten to power if Pius XII and the Catholic Church had directly funded opposition parties to the Nazis and that 
because of the concordat with the because of the concordat with the Nazis, that made it easier for the Nazis to come to power and consolidate power. And he says that, and when you say, well, look, Pius XI did that, Pius XII was the chief of staff at the time. They'll then say, well, yes, you know, the, the church sold out, the church sold out those people in Germany to protect their own property. That was his, that was his big, uh, that was his big critique. Um, and I guess what I would say is that if you look at, we now have lots of internal correspondence from the Vatican that was released, and there was virtually no one in the Vatican that thought that was the case, that was thinking in those terms. There was nobody outside the Vatican in the 1930s, 1940s, or 1950s that wrote a book about this. The only books we have about Pius XII from the 30s, 40s, or 50s were books saying how great a job he did handling the Nazis in such a difficult circumstance. Yeah. A lot of Catholics uh, were sent to concentration camps as well. Yes. Is the Vatican aware of the persecution going on internal to Germany? Uh, well, but I will say it was, it was difficult for anyone to know at the time because that was considered, um, you know, so, so the Nazis kept it so close to the vest. Um, we will say it is true that the Vatican did, the Vatican did know that there were lots of Catholics disappearing, um, but it was very difficult to confirm where exactly they were disappearing to. There were, I mean, for, for everybody, the concentration camps. It was very difficult to get an eyewitness who actually saw a concentration camp. And what the Nazis would always say, if you said, well, I've heard rumors about concentration camps. What the Germans would always say is, well, what do you expect our political opponents to say? Of course they're gonna make up stories like that. Can you honestly believe that a human being would do that to another human being, right? <laughs> right? <clears throat> so, uh, so it is, the Vatican did know there were, the Vatican did know that there were lots of Catholics disappearing. There were Catholic priests disappearing. Um, there were over 13 million Catholics who died in concentration camps. To put that in perspective, there were 7 million Jews who died in concentration camps. So there were almost twice as many Catholics as Jews. The difference is, is that Jews were specifically targeted because of their religion, whereas Catholics were targeted not specifically because of their religion, but because of their political opposition to the Nazis. Um, so, uh, that's, yeah. I mean, they were, were people disappearing, but no one for sure knew what that was all about. Yeah. I have a serious question. I really want to know. Infallibility, okay. Yeah. Because, because, because it's like, this infallibility, is it just on issues or doctrines of the church? It's on matters of doctrine. Could it also be the decisions of the, no. the Pope made? Okay. No. Yeah, no, papal, the definition of papal infallibility. I'm sure he did a lot of praying before he signed the concordat. Yeah. Okay, but so I was just wondering. Yeah, no, no, the, uh, the Vatican I makes it very clear that the Pope's infallibility refers to matters of dogma and doctrine, resolving matters of dogma and doctrine, and resolving resolving moral questions. In other words, is, yeah. is, uh, is, are certain actions right or wrong? The, the, the um, like in principle. Whereas the uh, the infallibility does not cover political decisions made by the Pope. And it's also, yeah. um, okay. also defined like the Pope has to be speaking ex cathedra. It's not just anything that he happens to say. Yeah. Yeah. No, it has to be it has to be an ex cathedra statement. He's self consciously. Yeah. In other words, he he has to he has to be saying he has to be saying this is this is the dispute that has come to me on doctrine or morality. These are the two sides. I am ruling on this decision, right? It, it can't. It's not a political decision because I mean, you could have. You could. I mean, we've had a series of popes that make bad political decisions, you know. Um, but we've never had. We've never had a pope that contradicts the teachings of the apostles on dogma or doctrine, or a matter of faith and morals. So. Were there a few popes that didn't even have a doctrine or something? come out because uh, two weeks ago you were talking about how yeah. the families, you know, they try yeah. to get their... Yeah, exactly. There, there, there are various time points in church history where po the popes themselves would deliberately not address matters of dogma or doctrine because they were like, oh, I don't care about that, or right. I'm, not, I'm not competent enough to address that. I'm a politician. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah. So, uh, before Pius XII became pope, he, his reputation was he was, the Va he, was, he was the Vatican's top diplomat. So he was the one that they would send to negotiate all the treaties with foreign governments. That's before he became pope. That was his, so he was not he was not a theologian per se. 
he had theological training, but most of his career was as a, as a diplomat, trying to resolve conflict disputes, conflict mediation, that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, a few more minutes. Okay. So in Spain, this is so this will bring us to the big issue in Spain, that in Spain in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the monarchy collapses in Spain, and this leaves you with a a military dictatorship in Spain in 1920s. Under that, the, uh, that was that was not, this, is, this is not under Franco. This is under Miguel Primo de Rivera. So there's a military dictator named Miguel Primo de Rivera for those who speak English. <laughs> who um, came in after the collapse of the monarchy. There was then, he then lasted until the Great Depression. When the Great Depression hits, he abdicates his dictatorship and says, I don't want to deal with this. Um, there's then a provisional government set up. Provisional government is set up in Spain that lasts from about 29 until about 1936. In 36, what ends up happening is that the Communist Party wins a plurality of the votes. And they go into a coalition with the, so the exact opposite thing that happens in Germany happens in Spain. Where the center parties decide, <laughs> well, we can either side with the fascists or we can side with the communists. The center parties decide they're going to co coalition with the communists rather than the fascists. What ends up happening is that the communists then suspect that the fascists are going to move against them in a coup. And, and they were. <laughs> They then deputize the communist paramilitary groups to go after the supporters of the fascists. Francisco Franco, who was, the, who was the top general in Spain at the time, is leading the fascist group. And he was trying to appeal, and one of his big claim, one, one of the big justification he gave for his moving against the government was that the communists were going to destroy the church. So what ends up happening is the Catholic center parties, the, um, the leadership of the Catholic center parties sided with the communists initially. But the rank and file members of the Catholic center parties didn't go with their party leadership. They actually said, eh, I'm not so sure. I, if I have to choose, I'd rather pick the fascists. So what ends up happening is that the communists then see that the base of Franco's support comes from the military and from rank-and-file Catholics who are not following their party leadership. The communist paramilitary groups then go after Catholic churches and nuns and priests and things like that to try to stop try to cut out Franco's base of support, popular support, popular legitimacy. So what happens is, is that the Vatican steps in and says, Franco has the more just cause here. Because Franco is trying to defend the Catholic Church against the communists, who are killing priests, nuns, lay people, burning churches, etc. The Spanish, the communist paramilitary groups killed over 7,000 priests in the three year civil war. So, the, so uh, this would have been under Pius XI. Pius XI steps in. He says Franco is more legitimate than the communist paramilitary groups. And the Vatican officially supports Franco. Franco then wins the war, wins the civil war, establishes himself as a military dictator, and then starts claiming that every single one of his policies was supported by the church. So Franco uses the church's endorsement of him during the Civil War as a lesser of two evils, and tries to use that legitimacy to like bolster all of the policies that he has. So like when he, so like when he cracks down political opponents, he says, well, no, the church supported this. Are you against the church? Well, you know, uh, most people in Spain are not going to claim to be against the church. So he's able to use, he's able to do things like that to get rid of his political opponents. Now, things that Pius XI and Pius XII obviously would not have approved of. Um, that being said, Franco does. There are certain things that Franco really didn't care about. 
like healthcare and education. So what he did was he delegated those things to the church. So under Franco's Spain, so Franco's in charge from 39 to 76. During that period of time, uh, the church was in so the church was in charge of all healthcare and all education. So education, you might say, actually improved in Spain during that period of time. Healthcare became more universal in Spain during that time. That being said, you've got a military dictator that shoots his political opponents. So you know it's. Uh, was then using the church as a way of justifying his positions. So, now it is true that um, now it is true that Pius XII seems to have thought that the fascists were less evil than Stalin, whereas FDR in America thought the exact opposite. So. That is one thing that is true. The Vatican communiques do say that the fascists are evil, but so are the communists. The communists are more evil. That, that being said, who cares? They're both evil, but if you had to pick in Spain between the fascists, who are claiming to protect the church, against the guys backed by Stalin, well, I guess you're going to go with Franco over the guys backed by Stalin. I guess the big thing they saw was that with uh, the fascists wanted to keep the church alive, even though they wanted to use it for their own ends, whereas the communists just wanted to obliterate it off the face of the earth. So better to like be alive and be working within the system rather than being obliterated and wiped off the face of the earth. So Eastern Europe, yeah, <laughs> Stalin. <laughs> You're dealing with Stalin in Eastern Europe. So uh, Stalin engages in this big campaign of killing off the Russian Orthodox Church, trying to kill off the Catholic Church in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, you know, so not, not Czechoslovakia, the German Church Czechoslovakia, in um, you know, the, the Orthodox Church in Romania, places like this. Right, so you're dealing with Stalin there. See, in the USA, for information on the USA during this time, Consult the book Parallel Empires by Massimo Franco. There really isn't a whole lot of this time in the United States. Basically, the United States, the Catholics in the U.S. are still experiencing a little bit of persecution, but for the most part, they're gaining in political legitimacy. Um, both, I guess, both political parties start trying to appeal to Catholics in the early 1900s. Once they realize that almost all the immigrants were Catholic, that's the thing they all had in common. Both the Democrats and the Republicans, in different ways, try to use try to appeal to immigrants for votes based on Catholicism. Um, let's, see. let's see. A couple of uh, anecdotes. Uh, not interesting anecdote. Okay. If anyone wants your interesting anecdote, I can tell you afterwards. Um, Latin America. Yeah, Latin America. The big issue in Latin America was that uh, the Spanish colonial governments had divided the difference in clergy. That did I talk about this last class? about how the, uh, the clergy, there were certain clergy, if you, there were two career tracks for clergy for either the natives or for the Spanish settlers, I did, okay. Well, during, between Vatican I and Vatican II in Latin America, this divide is getting even more stark, right? The priests that sympathize more with the natives and the priests that sympathize more with the Spanish, the former Spanish settlers, they're like diverging a lot as inequality in Latin America grows to the point where by the time after Vatican II happens, you're going to have liberation, the liberation theology crisis, where you've got certain priests openly advocating that the Catholic Church should be overthrowing oppressive governments um, by armed revolution. So um, that the seeds of that are sort of being sowed between Vatican I and Vatican II. Does anybody have any questions? Africa, Asia, mission territories. Yeah. What was the government like in Mexico at the time? Because uh, there was that, was that one movie. Uh, oh, yeah. The, uh, no, the Ocean um, McCall, the one with uh, Andy Garcia. Yeah, the one with Garcia. Oh, the one with Garcia. The one with Garcia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, that's happening, that's, that, so that's happening mostly in the 20s. That's happening mostly in the 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. So, this is happening. So, what happens is that in Mexico in the early 20s, there, the, the PRI gets power, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, 
the Institutional Revolutionary Party. They, uh, they get power in the 1920s, and uh, they run on a platform that is for improving the economy, improving the education, and um, getting away, getting rid of backwards traditions. Um, so they run on a secular platform. They win, and one of their first things is to do education reform and do a bunch of other reforms, but as part of those reform packages, they they basically make it illegal for the Catholic Church to operate in a variety of aspects. So they say they basically reduce religious liberty to just a freedom of worship, and then and then they place roadblocks in front of people from being able to actually worship. They then outlaw Catholic schools. They outlaw um, Catholic businesses. Right. So if you were a Catholic business owner operating during the time of the pre, um, you know you had to. Uh, you were not allowed to apply like your own conscience in your business, right? The pre would say you have to charge a certain, you have to pay people a certain amount. Um, you know, the pre would say you must, you must pay for things that the government deems are important for you to pay for. That's one of the reasons like, why the war about the Christianity movie came out recently. Because a lot of the things the pre were asking Mexican business owners and Mexican schools to do are very similar to like things that um, hap are happening here. Right now. Right now. Yeah. Only here we don't have an armed rebellion. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, so that's what basically happened. In the twenties and thirties, there's been this arm, there's an armed rebellion against the pre for putting these policies in place, and the pre then tries to counter the rebellion rather than negotiate with it. The rebellion is very successful because it's in sort of very remote areas of Mexico where the Mexican government <coughs> was not really that aware of the terrain, so they were very successful. But then what ends up happening is that the Mexican government then tries to seek an accommodation with the Vatican. They want to concord out with the Vatican. And what the Vatican does is say that they can keep those laws on the books as long for like the priest's political legitimacy as long as they promise not to actually enforce those laws that are on the books. Because the pre was claiming that we got elected running on this platform. You know, why should the why should these you know Catholic holdouts prevent us from implementing our, our, our stuff. You know, th think of the legitimacy problem for us. And the Vatican, based, the Vatican says, okay, you know, if, um, you can keep those laws in the books as long as you don't actually enforce them. And that was the accommodation reached. Well, the Christiata people, the, the, the Christiata rebels basically said, <laughs> what? <laughs> How can you possibly say that? Um, and and that, was, that was sort of the deal. Um, the Christiata, the Christiatas then had a hard time accepting that accommodation. Other questions? Any good news? Any good news? <laughs> Any good news from between Vatican One and Vatican Two? <laughs> uh, well, I guess you could. I guess you could maybe. Uh, well, let's put it this way. Politically speaking, there's not a whole lot of good news here. In terms, of, in terms of the external politics of the church, there's not really a whole lot of good news happening. That being said, one of the good things here is that one of the things that was contributing to political problems prior to Vatican I was always that the Pope was having to deal not with theological issues, but with political threats to the territory of the Papal States. Now that that is off the table, the popes are able to devote full time to making sure that dogma and doctrine are being regulated appropriately. So the, the silver lining here is that, yes, are there more political problems? Yes, there are a lot more bigger political problems. That being said, you might say never has the church had a better series of theologian books. Never, never before in church history, except perhaps you know during the period of the martyrs, would you have, have have we had a series of popes that are so one knowledgeable on dogma and doctrine, knowledgeable on theology, and have been able to devote full time to that? So one of the silver linings of this is that because those political issues are now off the table for the pope to be considering, for the most part, you're now mostly able to make you're now able to better keep track of uh, what's being taught, where, making sure it's done appropriately. And it will spend more time focusing on getting the church's message out rather than making trying to preserve the church's uh, political standing. 
So that is a, that is a silver lining here. And uh, next week we'll be talking about the internal internal political issues in the church between Vatican and Vatican II. Thank you. Yeah. Good day, everybody. Always lots of people talk.